and welcome to the Narrator Roundtable. I'm Deanna Anthony, one of your co-hosts today, and I'm joined by fellow co-hosts, uh, Kurt Graves. Hey! Hello, Deanna. <laughs> happy June, happy June. Happy uh, June. And Andre Santana. Happy June. Oh my gosh. What's Hello. going on? Now, that place where artistic expression and entrepreneurial enterprise merge for the independent author and the freelance audiobook narrator. For today's purposes, we're going to call it the indie market. And the thing about running your own business is that you can literally run your own business, choosing the partners that you want to work with, the projects that you want to work on, simultaneously designing your portfolio and growing your brand. So While you're building those relationships and managing those schedules as you go, I mean, what, what is that like? You know, what, what is that life? So there are many opportunities available to us as artists and entrepreneurs, as well as many different choices to make your operation process work for you. So we're going to dive into some very specific choices available to the narrator and joining us today to discuss just a little bit of this vast landscape that is audiobook narration in the indie space is Lacey Laurel. Hello. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank Um, you for having me. Of course, of course. Um, Now, narrator of 300 plus audiobook titles, Lacey Laurel is also a wife a mom, a casting director, a producer, a coach, and an Audi Award nominee. She also happens to be one of my mentors Mm -hmm. and has been part of like multiple firsts for me. So first, Lacey was the narrator on the first book I ever listened to that was authored by Rebecca Witherspoon. And it's called Rafe, y'all. Rafe, (laughs) R-A-F-E. It's amazing. I still love it. I re-listened to it. It's so good. (laughs) And then uh, she also gave me my first publisher and my first producer referral that eventually led to my first romance independent author relationship. Talking about big things here, okay? Mm -hmm. And then she also invited me to my first book convention that I attended. And I was a sign and narrator, y'all. So um, that was steamy lit. I'm definitely going to go back because I had a blast and I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. So. With all of that said, um, I'm really excited to get into this today. And we're going to start with ACX because that's where a lot of people start in the Mm -hmm. indie world. As far as the career path, ACX was built, uh, you know, for professionals. But sometimes we have people that we would consider to be hobbyists or part-time narrators. Like really now it's your choice on how much time you want to commit to that. And that's on the narrator side and also on the author side. So deciding to work in the indie um, market, whether, you know, it's branched someone else, somewhere else, what was that ACX experience like? And, and what did you um, discover uh, that helped it be a successful experience for you? I'll start with you, Lacey. It's like the wild, wild west. I'm going to be real. (laughs) It can be like the wild, wild west. When I started, I had no idea what I was doing. They do have like helpful videos up there that kind of give you a glimpse of what it is you're being asked to do. And it keeps it real. You're a lot of people don't realize that the contracts, everything on there, you're the producer. It says nothing about narrator. It's the producer because you're responsible to do everything to get it up to specs, to get it, you know, you want to make this professional sounding product. And going from not, I mean, I listened to audiobooks, but I had no clue what all that encompassed. So that's why I call it the Wild Wild West, because you're like learning as you go a lot of times when you're newer. Um, And that's, I mean, that's how I started. I didn't know, I think I had an inkling that there was publishers and they, they did audiobooks, but I found it on Google. And when you look, it's so much, I mean, there's listings and posts, you know, of all kinds of different books, genres, auditions is what they're posting up there for. And I just went at it. I I mean, I got all the equipment that it said to get all the stuff that it suggested that you do to make things easier tech side, tech side or tech wise. And then I just auditioned and I auditioned and I auditioned. And I thinking back on it now, I was really lucky because I was 
getting jobs almost immediately, mm-hmm. they weren't the best paying jobs monetarily. But what I learned, I, I wouldn't have been able to go as far as I have without learning those things that way. I think I had, oh, I want to say 80, 90 audiobooks before I started working with a publisher. Yeah. So everything that I learned, I, it, was, it, it was through there. And it was trial and error. It was trial and error until I really got a group of people that I felt I could navigate that with. And you could feel comfortable asking even the things that you think are the silliest things. You, could, I, I felt comfortable in that space asking, what does it mean when it says this? Or, you know, those kind of things and without fear of, you know, I mean, you can't really ask the author you're working for. because they, they don't right. know. ACX, uh, they did have this thing where you could upload stuff. But at that time, when I started in 2015, it took like a week or two for them to get back to you. To say, this isn't right. The specs aren't right. And I think one of the DAWs had a, a program that was written for audiobook narrators to kind of guide you. Um, but you just really didn't know. And it, it really just allowed space for growth. And if you were consistent, and I tell people this to this day, if you were consistent in auditioning daily, um, using it not just for the audition to get the job, but also using it to hone your technique. Um, your craft to practice, right? Uh, You really just kind of learned as you, you have the opportunity to learn as you go um, and still keep yourself to a high standard. I mean, it's it's all about what you make it. That's another reason why it's the wild, wild west, because there are people that go on there and they're just like, it is what it is, you know, but you still can hold yourself to a high level performance wise, tech wise, um, it allows for that, but it can allow for the opposite as well. Yeah. I was curious okay. when you started talking about when, about when you had started, um, because you said there are videos and I was like, well, there's videos now, <laughs> but back in the day there were articles. And if you didn't oh. have like some sort of engineering background, you didn't uh-huh. know what the hell any of those things yeah. were. And yeah. Cause Googling it started in 2010, and- right? Around 2010? I ACX did, yeah. So, yeah, but I came in about the same time as you, and I still feel like, I was like, no, give me a video that actually shows me what to do. Yeah, <laughs> so know? if I think back, the video was like a describing, right. but it didn't show you what to do. And I got lucky a couple of ways, because one, on Facebook, and I don't know what led me there. I think it was an article that mentioned the Facebook group for narrators. I got into that group and one of the admins of the group is Red Barnes and he taught. And that's how I learned. I, yeah. I, I started off paying, you know, to have it outsourced and just recording it and them telling me, no, 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 your sound's off. You have to redo this, you know? Um, and then that got expensive because I had no clue what I was doing and they didn't catch that. I had no clue what I was doing. Mm. So they didn't say, um, could you check out your room and see what's going on? But Don Barnes did. And yeah. that, that blew it open for me because yeah, I mean, you kind of, ha- for me, I have to have someone show me like literally show me. And we were on what I think now is Google meet. I don't think it was called that then. And he literally showed me, he would be like, okay, let me see your room. Let me see yep. what, what, let me see what your ceiling looks like. And this is what you got to do. So yeah, mm-hmm. wild, yeah. wild west. Because there, there yeah, was a bunch of people really who was. didn't know. It, it's so. Just, it was a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. it's funny listening to this because like, uh, because like the indie space feels like such a pristine example of this when it goes right. You mentioned like you connect, you find people who you can ask questions to, and people doing that over time is eventually what gets us like. ACX narrators Facebook page and gets us like professional audiobook narrators Facebook page. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, when I came in, I did my first book and it took like six months because I didn't know they were Facebook pages and then finding them. And and you know what it was? I think that piece that you said about like someone actually looking at your audio, I think, I think that framing of how do you actually understand the mechanics of it? in order to make decisions about like mm-hmm. your space. I think that's huge in the indie space because it was always backwards to me thinking like, it, you know, cause when I started, uh, things were shifting 
I was on Facebook pages and people were saying, you need to do 60 indie books before you work with publishers. And doing indie books is often harder, usually, right? It's more work. And that didn't make sense to me. But I think being the producer and actually seeing what it means to get good raw audio, to outsource, to hire people for post, like to get all the pieces to come together and having that piece of like connecting with the author and making sure the author is happy. Like for me, that's what makes indie work so chewy is like, you really have to see the whole picture. Um, and such a minor throw in. I love the small world of this in November at y'all fest, the young adult literary festival. I just met Rebecca Weatherspoon. Um, so I love this little, ah, great, Oh great, yeah. Great. She's amazing. <laughs> She's amazing. She really is. Yeah. I think Andre, what you're talking about is like for the longest time, any advice you could find on narrating from home was about the craft of narration. Mm-hmm. It took us a while, I feel like, in our industry to realize that we also have to train these folks to be engineers. Mm -hmm. If you want good quality audio to come in, you got to teach them how to do it. Right. And I agree with you on that. I think part of that is the fact that the, the bulk of the publisher work, right, was really... Um, driven by people going into the studio, like the hubs of New York and uh, LA in particular. And, and then everything changed drastically in 2020. Um, and maybe even late 2019, according to where you lived. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think even now, uh, it would be helpful maybe to even tier some of the information for people who have some technical background experience, maybe working in other VO or um, working in music, uh, you know, and then someone who is literally starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it has to be, you know, anything major, but I think that would be helpful. However. I will say this, I feel as if, uh, because you have to be self-driven, really, Mm -hmm. to work ACX. So in a way, uh, kind of uh, connecting to what you were talking about, Andre, being a self-driven person, you're going to do the research, whether that's starting with Google or literally by the seat of your pants going into um, uh, the, the website and just literally figuring it out step by step as you go or finding someone to mentor you or or coach you through the experience. Like it's the effort, right? That you have to kind of put into it, which I think automatically, even if you decide this is something you're going to do on the side, you're still running a business. If you're trying to do anything through ACX, that's just my personal opinion. Um, And you're right though. I mean, it was a studio world. Because even in ACX, like one of the first things they suggested was you'll you'll audition from home, but then when you record the book, you'll go into a studio and you'll pay them that studio fee. Mm-hmm. Like it just the 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 part of like actually recording at home was so like they, they didn't think actors would be coming into this mm. and just I, doing even, it on their own. I know actors that it took until the end of 2022 to get them to record at home. It was once they realized they're not opening up again. You're going to have to do something to make a living, get in that closet and let's see how we can retrofit it. Because there were people that were, you know, consistently used by the big five. Just everybody loved them. They went in the studio. They paid, they they are the author, you know, in their rate paid for the studio. And it wasn't until it was totally taken away that they were like, what do I do? And I mean, I had people message me, how do, what, what, what do I need? What do I, you know? And there were a couple of people that I'm like, okay, let, let's walk you through this. And this is what, this is how you start, but you're going to have to, and I used to be like, you're going to have to call Don if it doesn't work. If, if we can't get the specs just by me talking through you, let's not even waste time. Because I mean, it has to come in at a certain level for even the post-production team to really be able to edit it properly. Otherwise you're getting a horrid product that, they can't do anything with and it is all about owning a business they don't really promote that enough 
mm-hmm. um, being self motivated to make sure that you not only get the work, get the work done, prep, get the work done on time, or to an editor to get it done on time, get it to the author. Talk the author through distribution options, which you wouldn't really think that that was a part of a narrator's job. And in most cases, it isn't. But when you're in the indie sphere and you're working with an author that's never done this, has no clue what their options are. And around 2020 is when things really started opening up as far as people not feeling the need to only go through Amazon. And so it was learning that difference of distribution and what you're, I always tell them, I can't tell you what to do. I, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not, I've never published a book or an audio book. Um, well, that I wrote, right? Yeah. But I can give you all the suggestions on what clients of mine are doing. And then when I started publishing and holding audio rights, what I plan to do in this changing space. Um, you would think it's just sitting in front of a microphone in a booth and just reading. And sometimes I really would love that it is, but there's a whole lot more to it that I think ACX prepared me for more than had I come in the other way around. And I see why I have some narrator friends that came in the other way around where they came in from publishers. They came from on stage, on camera to publishers, and they're like, oh, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the indie. I don't want to have to do all of that, you know, um, but ACX really prepared me for a lot more than I ever thought I would be getting into when I decided I can do this. I could, I can narrate an audio book. Let's, let's do this. You know, it, it, it's just so much more. I really like how you said that, you know, people kind of show up, right. And, and, and they believe that they're ready, but they don't really realize everything that it takes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's kind of across the board, even like for acting, like there's parallels in that, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, some people who are actors, the only thing they ever do in the field is act, whether it's on stage or on camera. They are never a tech, right? They never work props. Do you know what I mean? They never mm-hmm. assist a casting director or director. Like they have no idea what the person on the soundboard does. Do you know what I mean? They never get into the other aspects of the field. So they never and truly a lot of that understand. I think is. is important. I mean, I've never done on stage other than high school plays, never done on camera. Yeah. I have a, a close friend who went to Tish and she's like, it's all important. If I know what the sound guy is doing, I know how much I need to project here or what what I can get away with performance wise that can actually be translated to the people in the back row. Yeah. And that's just stuff that you have to learn and know yeah. or you should. I mean, and yeah. there are people who don't and don't get me wrong. But when you hear people compliment people in in the field of acting, whether it's on stage, it's usually the people that are able that have knowledge of everything within their niche that get compliments because it's the other people going, Oh, the sound guy. Oh, I love working with them. Mm-hmm. The props people. Yeah. I love they're, they're they're not only are they polite, but they take care of the stuff so exactly. that they know, you know what I mean? Like just little because things they know like what that goes into a it. Good coworker. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Be and easy then, to work with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that parallels, you know, with every, you know, uh, hopeful, uh, baby narrator, um, that, doesn't necessarily realize that doing this work is basically making the decision up front to run your own business, right? Um, because in the beginning of all of this, um, you have the work and then you have the craft, right? And then you, right, the personage of you is like voice and talent and skills uh, that are technical uh, expertise, so to speak, like, um, how do you know that your sound is relatively going to be similar every single time you get into the booth? Like, that's a skill. Um, uh, you know, or the network you were talking about, like you finally got together, you know, with some people, with some peers, where you could actually have conversations where you were talking about the business, right? So you could give information that others didn't have, and you could receive information that you didn't have from each other's experiences, you know what I mean? Um, And so all of this encompasses the indie market, because as you said, essentially, whether we knew it or not, we, when we decided to start ACX as a narrator, 
we became a producer on the very first project that we put through that system. Mm -hmm. And so you said you did like 80 books, I think you said, right, before you actually worked with a publisher? Yeah, 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 60 to 80 books, somewhere in there. I mean, it may not okay. seem like 20, it may seem like 20 is a big gulf, but it, at the time it didn't, it felt like it went by like that. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I can kind of remember, I mean, I know the first author that got me on with a publisher, um, Dylan Allen, and it was because we had a deal on ACX for one of her books. And her book blew up from the time that I auditioned. Like I auditioned because I had been seeing her in the book space on Facebook. This is before TikTok, before they had book talk, all of that. It was Facebook and the Facebook groups and the Facebook group parties. And as a narrator trying to look for work in the indie space, that's where I found myself to find out who was publishing and what was, you know, where they were in their journey, if that was even on their thought process. And so when I had auditioned for her book, it, it in between then and finding a male narrator, because it was a uh, dual point of view, like a week after we found the male narrator, she's messaging me, hey, Tantor wants to sign me. I really kind of think I want to go with that, but I want you to come along with me. And I had heard from a couple of narrators that that's, a lot of people's first foyer into publishers when an author that they had been working with brings them along. And I didn't know it was that simple. Like it seems, it, it seemed like, oh, that's impossible. There's no way anybody in the indie sphere is going to have a deal like that that I'm going to be working with. But when it happened, it was so quick and so seamless. She, you know, I, it was as simple as, okay, if that's what you want to do, go, I'm not going to hold you, you know, we'll cancel this contract. Let's let you do that. And then I asked someone and I think it was, um, I, I can see his face. I just saw him at a signing. I can't think of his name right now, but I asked him because I remember him saying something similar and he said, just make sure they have narrator approval in their contract. Once they have that, they just need to wait it out. And Literally, that's what I told her. And she did that. And it took like a month. And then we were off and running. And I had my first, I actually got my first three jobs because they gave me another job on top of that. And then another job and then the job that she wanted me to do. So I mean, it kind of just spiraled. Um, but it was, you know, them bringing me along. And it was that relationship that I maintained from ACX and finding work for ACX that took me through. It's so funny to think back to that time when we had to convince authors that audiobooks were worth investing in. Mm -hmm. Because there was such a transition at a certain point when no longer were you, like, you didn't have to make the pitch for audiobooks to start mm -hmm. with. You just had to start pitching yourself because, like, the value of audiobooks had risen so much. People understood. Like, authors were telling each other, this is, this is when it's oh, worth it yeah. to invest in that. Um, but, yeah, when we started back in the day, like, the first pitch was, Hey, have you considered doing this in audio? Here are the reasons it might be good for you. <laughs> you know? And I got lucky on a number of people because they had author friends. They had like an author group and a couple of them had made it, not made it big, but like got audio, whether it was from a publisher or they did it independently. And they were like, it was like they were addicted. Once you did one, they were like, you got to do mm -hmm. it all. And so it became easier for them to go, okay. Then, I mean, you get into rate and things like that, which is a part of business. You have to know what you're worth and what you're willing to work for. Um, and that's changed over the years just with the, the whole AI thing that's drastically changed. It's kind of like I feel like I've regressed back into having to do that convincing like I did before. Um, in certain respects now when you're trying to discuss all of their options. Um, I've been lucky and I haven't had too many people come at me hard about wanting to do AI. I have one author that does it. And um, well, she, she did one and she did it because she was like, I want to know what is, what this is. I want to know what, what it is, what it's going to sound like, what the options are, what the contract looks like. And yeah, she was all, I feel like a snitch because I'm reporting back to you what the, what's going on. <laughs> and I was like, hey, any information you want to give to me, give it to me so that I can know and be informed about how the landscape is changing because I have no control over it, right? So I just have to right. learn 
what the options are. And, and I told her, I remember telling her, I feel like now this is going to go back to the way that I used to have to convince people about audio back in 2015, kind of now about human voiced audio, which is, it, it's wild. Um, but my husband always says things are circular, cir- circular, like everything comes in cycles. And he's all, you find yourself on that same cycle in life over and over again with added things. But I mean, if you recognize the pattern, then that you can ride that through. Like that story speaks to such another part of indie work that's so cool is you get to create relationships with these authors to the Mm -hmm. point where they do confide in you. They do, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're like out there and then they're reporting back on what's going on in author land. And like, I have some really great friends in my life now that are just authors that I worked with. And yeah. sometimes I have to remind myself, oh yeah, that's how I know them first. Like that's how we were introduced because now we're just friends. Yeah. Yeah. One of my absolute best friends, it was ACX. She and yeah. I, uh, she's not a visual person. So when ACX was presenting her with contracts and stuff, she got through it to post her book. And then when I auditioned, she loved my audition and she, she messaged me, can, can I call you? Because this is a lot. I need, I need to talk it out. And I remember very vividly, I was dropping my son off at school and I was driving and I was explaining everything to her about dual point of view, hiring out another narrator, what our contract could look like. I mean, because it's it's a lot of business stuff, but it's a lot of stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And for her, it was the just talking, hearing it verbally. It, it just connected to her and then she was able to think on it. And now, I mean, we've done eight audiobooks since then but more what I'm more proud about that is the friendship that she and I have it doesn't matter whether I'm her narrator or not we talk to each other like every other day about stuff that is not even book related necessarily and then we talk to each other about stuff that is business related but doesn't have to do with me narrating her stuff just what she's going through in her author career and the changes she has what I'm going through in my narrator career um and just how things change but our kids I mean just all kinds of stuff and I wouldn't have that if I didn't have that relationship that we had on ACX because each of my authors and I I I could be different than a lot of people but each of my authors the the books that I find that are the most successful or most fulfilling I have some kind of relationship with the author it doesn't have to be like a a friendship best friends or you know we we don't necessarily kiki about things but it's a thorough business relationship. Um, and they feel comfortable coming to me with their questions, what they've, something that they've learned or heard from somewhere. And I can come to them when I hear about changes in the industry and they're like, oh yeah, let's do this. The uh, box setting on ACX became a huge thing. Um, adding content, ACX did this whole ACX university thing and they announced that you know authors should add extra chapters you know, bonus chapters from other things to kind of have follow through and going through all that stuff with all of my clients and being comfortable to to email them up. Hey, I haven't talked to you in a little while, but this is what's changing. And, you know, think about how you want to handle this or if you want to be a part of this, Um, just building how to be a business person and maintain relationships and communication. Communication is huge. And it's something that, I mean, I'm human. I have things that I struggle with. I, 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 work in a little box. I like to just go and do my work and just be about me. But learning to communicate and being the first one to communicate things is really important. And I don't think I learned that skill until I started using ACX. Because every job I had had prior to that, I was just a cog in a machine. You know, I was the receptionist or I was a unit secretary. I just always did specifically what I was told. Um, And even though I had my MBA, I never started my own business and knew how to do I mean, I had learned about it, but I hadn't really done it. You don't learn. I don't think it grasped into my knowledge until I actually started doing it consistently. Yeah. I love where all of this is going. Like the the, the little tidbits, you know, that we're kind of getting, I think that are huge, right? Like the fact that you learn, you said to learn to communicate first. Like I'm, I might've been triggered. I don't know. Um, I was like, Oh, (laughs) yeah. I didn't think of it that way. And I think Andy Arndt was the one, you know, we were talking and she was just like, you have to be, you have to communicate with your clients and you have to be first about it and be intentional about it. Um, because 
this is, you're the expert in the relationship, right? This is your expertise. Just like when they go to an editor to get their books edited, they're trusting that editor to know their job, right? So they're trusting you to know your job. On ACX, it's not just the performance part of it that you're expected to know, it's all the other stuff that you're expected to know and to, to navigate. And being communicative about what your experiences are, what you are, I mean, little things like, you have to send me the manuscript. <laughs> you, you have to pay me and I don't get paid through the ACX portal. I mean, right. there's so much that it does not make clear to them. Um, I mean, it's there, but it's not in a way, it's not, I can't even tell you how many times people think that they are going to upload their payment to ACX. That's something that's so basic that should be so broadly written on that end. And it's not. not and it's all. not. And it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is all like so great. So somewhere in between, right? Was it during these uh, 60 to 80 books that you did? Or was it after when you first started working with publishers that you were like, you know, I'm doing a lot of this uh, and I'm going to start a production company. Like what prompted that? It was because I was already doing the taxes and I was already doing it. Right. So because you're the publisher, I don't think narrators really think of it as such, but you are your own production company, whether or not you are a company that goes out and solicits business in a certain way or um, visually splashy in a visually splashy way, um, or you even know how you're going about it. But when you're the producer, you're doing it all. You're, you're doing it all. So taxes, you have to have things lined up for payment. You, like, you know, LLC, start, you start to hear those conversations. When you start to hear the word LLC and something goes off in your brain, whether you really know that that's something that you should be doing or looking into, that's when I think people should really think about just formalizing their production company. Um, because what the process of how you're going to start to take payments, hire out people, if you're working in dual narration, I think that's what it was, is I was working in dual narration. So I'm helping cast not just my voice, but another voice and having to manage that when they're going to have it in, how are their pickups going to be handled, their post-production, um, how are they going to get paid? Is it going to, all those little things that I have to organize and make sure get finished from A to Z. And at that moment, I was like, oh, ding, 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 that's what this is. So let's package it up because we need to brand it as something if I'm going to continue doing this. And because I was working mainly in romance and I was doing a lot of dual and I was dabbling in duet, I was like, yeah, this is it. And I think it was like right after I started working for publishers or right as I was starting to, because the author that I'm thinking of that I started really doing it with, the one that's my really close friend now, Dakota, that was when she was like, you need to have this put together more like g get a name, get a brand, get a website. And I got lucky because the group that I was in where it was the narrators that we got together. I want to say we got together every month, once a month. Um, one of the narrator, one of the girls, she she did web design and she did it specifically. She started her own web design business for narrators because she knew mm. what publishers wanted to see when they went to look at you. Or what authors wanted to see when they went to your site, you know, samples, boom, that needs to be front and center. <laughs> and then you also need to have something that shows what you have done. And then client, you know, she already had like um, just a, a template of what everybody's site needed to have. And then because she went to school for graphic design, she stylistically can make it about whatever you felt your brand was going to be and make it kind of flow. Listening to all of this and even thinking, you know, I, I started on ACX, did very little work there, and then moved to working with publishers. And so much of this conversation is so interesting because every tier of it is still applicable, right? Whether it's about even just what you were just talking about, uh, thinking about websites and what do people want to see about your work and how do you market yourself, that's still applicable when you're working with producers. But everything about being your own production company, about understanding what all the pieces are that you like, uh, you need to keep your eye on knowing what comes in the production process. I think 
in the way that you were talking earlier, right? Like you're on set, but you know what everyone does and it, cr- it improves your work. That like being able to get an audition from even a publisher and be like, oh, okay, here's what they're looking for. Here's what the author is looking for. Here are all the pieces and how they're coming together. Like it's the same kind of, uh, there's a word I'm looking for, but an ability to like recognize patterns, to assess. Like I, I love actually how applicable those two things become across mm-hmm. like whatever space you're working in. For me, I think I'm glad that I started the way that I did. There are certain things that I wish I had. There's certain programs that are around now, or at least that I know about now that I'm like, man, if I had that when I started, I would have learned so much faster. But when I think about it, it's okay. You know, I, there's still stuff that I can gain from those programs or from classes. Um, I'm glad that I, I did it the way that I did because I learned a lot about myself, which I think any business owner, really ones that are, I don't want to say, oh, I'm so successful, successful business owners do that. But ones that are around, that last, that are consistently in business year after year after year, mm-hmm. it's because they learned about themselves as people and how to run their business or how to do their job. Yeah. Um, how that worked with their personality, what worked best for them to, you know, what they could put in place to work best with them. Yeah. And, and our generation of narrators is learning off of your work and your like labor that you put in and the things that like, you know, became cohesive over time with you. Mm-hmm. So thank you both right. of you for <laughs> the time welcome. you put in, <laughs> the struggles you suffered through. <laughs> <laughs> We are on the shoulders <laughs> of um, giants. I mean, but hey, basically. like that's another cool thing about this industry is we really do all help each other out. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. and love to do yeah. it, and love to do yeah. it. And like, if I can help somebody avoid some of the things that I had to go through, or just to know, hey, you're going to be expected to do this, this, and that. So keep that in mind, and know when you walk into that conversation. Um, I do, th- I, I occasionally, or, well, I haven't done it in a while, the mentoring program for APA. And I love being able to let them know, like, hey, look, know what you're, what, what you're going to ask for. Know, know this, this, and that. So when you walk into that space, you can feel confident that you are actually able to give them what they're asking for, but in a way that doesn't like deplete you and you're not up all night long trying to figure out what the heck to do. And your voice goes out on you because you've been up all night long and you're just like, what do I do? You know, taking that away from people, I love being able to give whatever knowledge that I have. You don't have to use it if they don't want to. Like I tell my kids, you don't have to do it my way. I'm just showing you what I did and then get lean from it what you can and and keep keep it keep it going. But that that kind of discernment, I I think we can't understate the importance of that kind of discernment because even this week, this past week, I was seeing a Facebook thread. Someone didn't have great audio. They talked to a friend who does voiceover, um, I think might even do audiobooks a lot. And the friend was like, yeah, you're just not going to work if you don't get an Apollo twin. <sighs> For our listeners, I, I'm gasping, raising my hands in shock. You know, like <laughs> I had the people in the VO spaces I shared who are like, you're just not going to work if you don't buy a Neumann microphone, the $5,000 microphone, right? Like the the kinds of knowledge we have, all these things you're saying about like, learning about how ACX runs, learning about uh, even even um, distribution options, like knowing all those things will help you identify like what the right choices are as the, as the options like come in front of you. And in publisher work, there's only so many asks and options. In indie work, you make every decision. Mm-hmm. Um, And sometimes that decision is you get the manuscript and you have to decide if you're going to do that book because it clearly hasn't been edited or like, you know, all those different things. So that kind of discernment, I feel like is fundamental. Yeah, Yeah. that in itself. I mean, because it's indie work, right? So Mm. I was just talking to someone about the fact that there are authors that I love the story that they're telling, Mm. but that doesn't mean that the way in which it is written is as put together and polished as I may think it should be, Mm. they're just not there yet on their journey. So you have to learn how to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to be a part of that journey still in spite of that, because you don't want to want to offend 
Um, we're not editors. That's not our place to tell them that. And so you have to make the decision if you're going to be a part of it as is and put your spin and your performance on it, or if you're going to bow out and, and, and try to find a way to guide them somewhere else. It was a project where the male narrator kept bringing up to me, but it's written like this and it says that, and I don't want to, and I'm like, okay, I don't think this is for you. And that's fine. I'll find another, a narrator. Um, you're not seeing what I see, but you're also not the producer on this, right? So you're not the one that's going to be looking at it in a certain way. And the one cool thing that I always tell my husband about this is that choice that I have as to whether or not I'm going to take something. I mean, sometimes I feel like, I think when I started, I felt like I didn't have a choice. I wasn't going to work if I didn't do this or, you know, you, feast or famine. You hear that a lot, right? So you take yes. on stuff. But I've learned through the years, and it's just a level of comfort that you have to get yourself, like you have to have yourself. And everybody's situation is different because everybody's situation is different. What people can afford to pass away and what people have to take to be able to, to eat, right? But I've learned that for me, if I'm not comfortable with it, let it go and something else will take its place. Mm. Um, and there's some times where I'm like, okay, something else should be coming around here. Or something should have came last week. Um, but, you know, you, you have to learn what to do what's best for you. And you have a choice. We have a choice. Like, we're not made, like, you know how you hear the stories of the studio actors in the 30s and 40s where they were just told exactly what movie to make and what their persona and their brand was going to be. We have those options. We don't have anyone telling us anything different. Um, you know, and, and sometimes other people may not like to hear what our answers are. I had an author, uh, my friend Dakota, she wanted to have a narrator narrate her book. And he doesn't like spice. And, and he's being as polite as he can about it. And she's just like, but it's okay. And I go, girl, stop. You, do you know what you write. I love it. I have no problems reading it. And I know five other male narrators that have no problem reading it either because you have a story, you have a happy ending, you're in romance, contemporary romance, right? Like we know what we're getting into. This person is an on stage actor. That's not what they got into it for. So you don't want to have somebody who doesn't really want to be reading your words, reading your words anyway. So that's something else that I, I've had to learn how to navigate. And especially when it comes to dealing with authors and author relations and casting. Um, they may want someone and I know that that someone is not going to want their work or not be available just because they don't have time. They're not, they're, they're not booking until next year. Yeah. I, it's interesting, right? Because Andre was talking about, he didn't really know like what word to use. And so I'm going to say like maybe between two choices, skills with a Z oh. mm -hmm. and like business muscles. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, it's almost like this thing that you've got to train. You got to learn and you got to train yourself to have a certain proficiency mm -hmm. at doing right. So that it streamlines the process, whether it's the tasks that you're doing independently on your own as the narrator, as the producer, all the admin and, um, coordination, right? Uh, behind the scenes, or if it's all of the pieces that are connective and interactive where you're working with another narrator and or narrators, right? Because like, mm -hmm. what if you've got like this extra, very specific character and you're like, oh, let's authentically cast that. Mm -hmm. So then in a, in a duet situation, you have three people or maybe four people, right? Because of what the storyline is. And then, and then the author, <laughs> the author who is precious right about <laughs> everything having to do with this beautiful delicious word salad baby that they created of this book right so in that um 
I had done a little bit of research and like looked and like really paid attention to who was doing what and going where for book conventions before I even committed to ever do one. And the funny thing is, is I was going to go to Steamy Lit like just as a fan, like just as a reader listener, because I just wanted to check it out. And I was attracted to the demographic that they were marketing to and the authors that were interested and agreeing to sign up um, for last year's, which was the inaugural. And so it was so funny. I was ready. I was registered and everything. And then I get this email and I was like, what? (laughs) I was like, yes, 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 whatever it is, I will follow you. I will come. I will go. And I learned so much. Um, that, what, what was it? It was two days, three days? It was two um, days. In, two, in, days. I, two days in Anaheim. Well, I, but yeah, I, I mean, three days jam- you were there, but two days of jam-packed just yeah. people. And I mean, I, I simulate um, literally. So I went, my first sign that I went to was Allure. And. Allure was uh, audiobook based, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a bunch of narrators that were there, authors who were into audiobooks. So it kind of was like, uh, especially after COVID, a coming home. You know what I mean? Like this is one of the first things that we're getting together and we're getting to do something, right? But Steamy Lit was, for me, uh, being a Black woman in America, being able to walk into a room and see a ton of other people that look like me. Mm. And everybody is so welcoming and, hey, girl, hey, what, what's, oh, my, you know, wanting to know if they didn't know who you are, who are you, what do you do, oh, what do you, you know, uh, just so excited to be there and be amongst each other. And I don't think I really understood what it was like for authors of color, um, especially, well, in general, but in romance specifically, to go into certain rooms and feel ignored. I did not, I mean, I I know what that feels like personally, but I just did not, I I didn't get how much they felt that. And so when we walked into that space, it was created to be an open space so that whatever your other was, whatever other in you that you were, uh, whether it's the color of your skin or your sexuality, you got to go into that space for those couple of days and everybody was excited to meet you and want to know what it was that you did in the literary world. And, oh, you write this? Okay, you know, let me, let me, you know, th- some of the authors that we were sitting next to or that were sitting next to our booth, learning about what they write about and then diving into their books because I never even knew they were around. Um, that signing was special and that just the feeling that it gave you um but then also just getting to sit there and chat with you and and go back and forth and talk and meeting some of the authors like I've seen uh C.D. Reese at a couple of things but never really had the courage or um to go up to her and she one of her earlier audio books was just a game changer for me as a fan in, in the way that I viewed romance and the performance of an audiobook and where it could take me in the story. Um, it just, yeah, Steamy Lit was, it, I, I'm excited for this year. Um, and I had just went to Book Bonanza, which was a good signing too. It was a really good signing, but it was very mainstream and there weren't a lot of authors of color there. I think, was I the only, no, I was not. Benjamin was there. So I wasn't the only narrator of color. And there was only a handful of narrators. So we all banded together, right? And anytime you get handy narrators in a group together, it, it's we're going to make it do what it do. Like, I just went to the Denver signing. It, the world was falling around on fire around us, but we were in our space and we were enjoying each other's company and we were just having a blast. So I think a lot of narrators came out of that signing like, there was something wrong. We had a fun. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, there was tons of things wrong and I saw it, but I, it didn't matter because I was with you guys. Right. Um, you know, getting to talk about just catch up with each other. Some people I hadn't seen since Allure, some people I had never met before, but I had been in spaces or had narrated with them. Um, I, I, narrators are a special group of people because we're going to get together and we're going to have a good time. And there's no doubt like how valuable that is. 
But my question is, when you, like, did you get work out of it? Yes. <laughs> okay, because yes. that's the thing that I, like, again, as a, as a person in the indie space, and you're going to meet these indie authors, and you're like, mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, Gay Rom Lit and Allure and a- 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 ALA's conference, and it's like, where's the work? so it's nice that i'm meeting you but like would anybody like to throw me a gig yeah 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 when i so when i went to lore i think oh well that was not my audience that (laughs) turns out that was like all straight romance i (laughs) I was like okay i don't think i got work out of lore but book bonanza i did not think i would get any work and i did um it did not come right away but it came and when it came i was like she wants we, oh okay how did she hear about me and she was like well you were at book bonanza we were on the train thing together i never talked to her <laughs> okay i never talked to her but the production company she went with was there and when she you know mentioned that and they mentioned well she was there she was like oh yes 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 let me let me yeah let's do that let's let's roll with her i remember her being there steamy lit i did i got more work i think out of steamy lit and more relationships out of steamy lit um because it was it was it was very diverse so there were authors that were looking there was an audience for everybody there mm, yeah. but the key to conventions for narrators because we don't sell books so we don't make money that way we make money by bookings and i really try to impress that upon any um convention thrower that wants to talk with me for a couple of minutes like I know it may not be in your budget, but I'm just letting you know, we don't really sell a lot. It's hard for us. It's expensive for us to sell stuff because we don't have the rights to the book. Like that's not going to make us any money. Bookings is what makes us money. So we need to have a time that we can go around and talk to all the authors. Mm. So the ones that I've been successful at, one of the reasons why is because they have a long period of setup before the signing starts. Get there at the beginning of setup. When they're setting up, walk around, offer to carry. Hey, let me let me get that box for you. Or, oh, I just want to see, you know, just naturally talk to people. You still have to put yourself in the outgoing space, which for me is a lot. At the end of the day, I was drained. But I got to learn a little bit more about the authors. And a lot of the authors at Stimulate, they had not been in audio yet. So they had heard about it. They knew it. They knew they should be going in that way. So being able to bend their ear a little bit and educate them, I think that was the thing, you know, the, that made them go, oh, okay. You know, it, even if it wasn't me narrating to produce the work for them. Yes. But I will, you know, there's a lot of, Stimulant was a large convention, right? A lot of them are not large. So you really do have to pick your audience. Um, I know some narrators that are going to everything, all the things once a month, they're at something and flying here and there. And I'm like, more power to you. I have to be very strategic with what I do just based on where I'm at in my life. You know, I mean, I I have five kids. I I can't be flying around every month going somewhere, but also because I want to up the chances that I'm going to get a job from it. I, I want to, you know, being on a panel that helps because you get people that will see you that would never have seen you if you're just walking around um, being on a correctly placed panel, like something that you actually, a genre that you actually work in is right. even more is the cherry on top. But um, just making sure you pick your signings based on who's going to be there, what genres they write um, that kind of thing, because yeah, there are a lot of smaller ones. Uh, I went to a small one in San Francisco once and I went and I volunteered. And I didn't get any work out of it, but I wasn't really working the room at that time. I just wanted to see what is this signing thing? Like, cause I had never been to one. I didn't know. So I did a little research and was like, oh, so they do this and people come and they pay money to do what? Okay. You know, and then that's when I, the wheel started turning of, well, how can I incorporate this for me? Um, The main thing I think is picking a signing that has the genre that you work in or want to work in. But also one in which you can participate in panels is also a bonus. Um, And getting out there early during the setup time so that you can talk to them. Because when they're trying to, you know, fans are trying to get in there. Fans are trying to get in there. They they don't have time for you. They want you out the way. (laughs) They want to be able to get in and get their autograph or get their signed, you know, merchandise. I found that all of my things were either at the get together the night up or the first night there. 
Um, the bar afterwards was a good place. If it, well, Stimulus Bar was small. I think Book Bonanza had a little bit of a better space when it came to that because they had a room for only authors and narrators. And you know how they tell you when you go to APAC, just go and enjoy it. Don't try to pitch yourself. Just go and have genuine. That's what that room at Book Bonanza was. Just walk in and just be genuinely you and have a good time. And then that's how I met people. I mean, that room was a trip because as a narrator, as a romance girl, I think one of the first books that I read that really got me in back into reading and then towards audiobooks was Fifty Shades of Grey. So for me to walk in and see C.D. Reese and E.L. James sitting at a table chit-chatting with Andy Arndt, I was like, what world am I in that these people that, okay, you know, I mean, if you know, you know, like those are the people that make a lot of what we do, that, that have made a lot of what we do possible in many ways. But it was just being in that room and just being genuinely me and having a good time and getting to know them as a person. And then it was kind of like APAC where you did that and then all the other stuff came later. I just want to uh, highlight one thing you said that I think is really important uh, for anybody who's getting started in the indie space, which is that it, unless you're charging extra for it, it is not our job to promote the book or the audiobook. Yeah. Because that is a trap I fell into. It's a trap I know a lot of people fall into is like pitching yourself as somebody who's very active on social media and you promote every book and you're on there talking, you're doing panels and podcasts and you're like, you can really lose a lot of money making time mm -hmm. by doing all of that extra work. Um, when again, we're actually pretty limited in what we can do because we don't own the rights to the book or the audio once we're done with it. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, unless unless somebody's willing to pay you extra for that extra work, like yeah, be the no, producer, it's a tight be the narrator. Rope. It's a tightrope. You want to yeah. be able to say, "Hey, it's coming out," and yeah. like I've seen a couple of narrators that have I'll a repost. really good yeah, yeah. That I am the queen of putting of it on my story. Yeah. Or you know, sometimes if you can have someone who you give like an, for them to do an hour or two every couple of weeks of social media posting, and they post, but never invest more in promoting a book that you do than you can really afford. And you really have to sit there and sometimes have a come to Jesus talk with yourself because someone was saying something earlier and it made it click to me. And what you just said uh, is making me remember my thought in that for an author, their, their work is so precious. It's their words. And it is because I mean, if they if, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be here doing what we do. But they have that one book, two books, three, maybe four books a year that they're doing. We, when we're working full time, it's way more than that. So we can't spend forever and a day always promoting just the one book. We have to move on to the next. We have to prep it and get ready. Talk about that, maybe that that's coming or that we're in there recording that. But keep it brief and keep it consistent. I've seen a couple of narrators that have like a pretty consistent way of like a, a post that they do where they literally say, hey, this is coming now. This is what I just did. This is what's next. And they do that pretty consistently, like once a week. Even if that's all that you do, that's a lot for a lot of authors. Yeah. And, and that's even enough. that's even that's promoting yourself, right? That's exactly. saying, look, I'm busy. Exactly. You know, it's the what the content of, of what you've done is really secondary. It's saying like, look at me, I'm working. I'm yes, that type rope. You're me. getting their work out, but you're getting you out. And the fact that you did this performance and, and that's the type of promoting you should do. It shouldn't just be all about the book. I mean, it, it can't just be all about the book if you want to be successful and get other jobs from it. it. That's just not the nature of it for narrators. And I mean, even when you go to conventions, you can talk a little bit about what you did, but you, you're moving on. You know, we, we've got, I think one year I did like 50 or 60 books. That's 50 or 60 books. If I spent the time to give each one of those no matter no, what my you. contract looked like, it, it just, yeah. it, I'm never getting, I'm not getting that kind of work done. So yeah, that's and important you, to remember too. You can talk about the work you've done that you love because that helps other people know what to hire you for. So you're mm -hmm. always going back to like getting hired because our, and I, again, I've had this conversation with authors and, and conference runners as well that like our audience isn't readers. It's just not. Our audience nope. is the people who can hire us to narrate audiobooks, which is either independent yeah. authors, 
production houses or publishers. That's that. our audience for marketing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, it is what it is. That's a, that. Yes, fans can say, oh, we want so-and-so, but they don't control whether or not so-and-so does the audiobook. They, I right. mean, sometimes in the indie sphere, they might, if the, if the author is just like, I don't know what to do. They said this, I did this. But that's not the majority of the work. It's going to be the, the casting room at the publishers, you know what I mean? Or the author that genuinely likes your, your work and your portrayal of their character. Those are the people that we have to pay attention to. Two, two things coming up for me. One other space I've heard that's gone well for indie narrators is uh, 20 books to 50K, the Las Vegas event annually. I've that's seen a several big people space. go there. I've yeah. seen several people go there. I've not, I've not gone there. I've thought about it. Um, but I've seen several, and every year it seems to grow. Mm -hmm. And I think that, especially because as a narrator, not all narrators have just one genre. Right. And that convention seems to have a whole lot of genres and a whole lot of people who are at different stages. Um, and I think that's maybe why that is a little bit more fruitful. Um, I, you can, I, I, I love romance, but it's not the only thing that I do. It's the right. thing I may do the most, but it's not the only thing that I do by any means. I just got through doing a 14-hour business textbook. And I would have never, you could have never told me that I would get hired for that and actually love it. I, you have to be open to a lot of things. And I think when you pick a, a convention like that, you're opening yourself up to a lot of things. Um, for me, like, uh, because I'm more on the publisher side, the way that I go to events is slightly different, but I'm hearing a lot of parallels. Um, I mentioned uh, Y'all Fest, Young Adult Literary Festival in Charleston. Um, and what was interesting about that is like, you mentioned Kurt, like authors are our audience, producers are our audience. Um, and just being able to be in rooms and connect with authors, like, you know, in the indie space, you're their first point of contact, but a lot of publishers don't let us communicate with authors. And so mm -hmm. I got to meet some of my own authors for the first time, um, connecting with people, even folks who like, you know, for example, like every book they've written so far have been first person characters that don't overlap with me, like in no time soon, soon and I'm, am I going to be one of their narrators, but even just being able to like hear about the work and be like, Oh, I, I know someone who's going to be great on your next title or, you know, those kinds of like small connections. And for me, the other big piece is um, starting to like follow folks's work whose stuff I'm interested in, in the future as well. Right. Like they're working on a title that I can go and email and request an audition for, or something along those lines. Um, but like, I, I recently finished my like FOMO run the gamut of like going to as many events as possible. I went to the um, American Writers and Writing Programs uh, conference, uh, which was like 16, 17,000 people and oh, wow. actually was mostly indie publishers um, and was really interesting. And I met like 10 of my authors for the first time there. Um, and even going to, uh, you know, APAC. Uh, and like you said, like mostly connecting with narrators, not trying to like hunt down producers at those events. Um, but like, I've really, I think in the future, I am focusing much more on this kind of like, uh, this kind of framework of like um, connecting with authors as real people, because also, you know, sometimes authors do get that piece in their contract. They get the um, ability to request the narrator to have final approval on the narrator. Um, and being requested is a big thing in the, um, pr uh, in the publisher space. Um, so just being able to connect with folks and, and be kind of on their radar, I think is valuable. Um, but two, even when they don't, uh, necessarily, um, determine whether you're being booked, I think indie folks also get this when, when the space aligns is like, you do get to connect with readers who like enjoyed your work and you do get to connect with people who are able to talk with you about those projects. And I think that kind of thing is just like a, an experience of like a catharsis of some kind. For me, sometimes it feels like the conclusion of, of working on a book. And, and I do, I think there's always something about like indie publishing specifically about this, like almost like hand to hand passing of a book or an experience that I kind of love. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a fun little events have always been like an interesting 
kind of component of our work and both starting it, but also finishing it. I think what you were saying um, is key. I was just talking with someone who's thinking of bringing audio to an event that's coming to Atlanta um, next year. And she was asking me, do you think so-and-so would come and -and so-and-so would come? And I was saying to her, well, this person's journey as a narrator was publisher first, right? So when you ask her to come, she's in the space of, okay, they're going to bring me here. They're going to put me up in a hotel or this and that, because that's the world that she's from. I'm an ACX person. I'm like, I'm, is this a business write-off? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's different right. for me because I'm pitching things differently than she is. Um, but I think that's the cool thing to me about what we do as narrators period, because it's such a wide net of different just, you know, with a net, there's all these different holes and all these different entry points into it, right? Um, one of the things that I love about indie is that we get to talk to our authors and we can kiki with them about their characters and why did they do this or what, what were you thinking when this scene was coming up? When you're working with publishers, like you said, a lot of times we're not allowed to talk to them. That is not, you can get into some serious trouble if you do talk to them. So it's always knowing where what space you're in so that you can um, address what, what you're trying to get out of a convention the right way. That's the thing that's like cool, right? Because working in the indie space is multifaceted, mm. you know, and what is that term they say? Like the jack of all trades, like. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to take on the responsibility of completing every bit of the process because you can hire out, right, Mm -hmm. for a lot of the process in the actual production of it all. But you should have the knowledge, right? You should know the recipe um, and the opportunities that are available for us to have a closer connection, actual relationships, uh, you know, with the creator of the work that we're doing is a very different experience in the indie market than working with the publisher, where sometimes you have no contact ever with the author. Um, And it just depends, right, on what the project is. But then on the other side, um, I mean, I had a really good time just hanging out and talking to the readers and the listeners, because they really were just open and like you said, happy to be there. And it was just amazing to just have all that energy swirling around you. It was wonderful to kind of be enveloped in that, you know, for two days. It feels good to be, to, you know, when you're coming from a space of being in a booth and you're by yourself and then you go into a space where someone has actually listened to your work and they like it. Yeah. <laughs> they like the choices that you made, whether it's the author or a listener, and they want to talk about your experience in it, or you know, they want to know something about you. That stuff can feel really nice, and it's kind of rewarding because otherwise, you think I put this out there. Is it really? Did anybody hear it? I mean, you see reviews, but reviews are not always the nicest written things for various yeah. amount of reasons. No, they are not. Yeah, but. You to have someone who genuinely enjoyed what you did and to come and tell you, I think that's the coolest thing. I, think, I mean, to I, make a, I get to do that with authors too, and I think that's yeah. cool too. Yeah, yeah, to make a real human connection for that human voiced work that you have put in, I mm. think you just can't beat that. Oh my gosh, this was so freaking amazing, and I could keep talking. Um, Because we didn't actually hit everything that I wanted to talk about, but I'm not going to hold you because like you said, you have five kids. So (laughs) thank you, thank you, thank you, Lacey, for being our guest co-host today. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Y'all, this is Lacey Laurel. Go out there, go to the library, go to where you want to get your audiobooks. Lacey Laurel, okay? And um If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere that podcasts are available, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. And of course, don't forget to subscribe at YouTube, right? 
And uh, if you want to join the conversation, you can find us on social media. We're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook and Twitter. And you can visit our webpage, which is narratorroundtable.com. And you can submit a question or topic for discussion for any future episode. What is on your mind? Because we really want to talk about it. Thank you. And bye-bye. The Narrator Roundtable is produced and hosted by Andre Santana, Deanna Anthony, Gail Shallon, Kurt Graves, and Lindsay Dorcas. All copyrighted material is shared with permission. Music and sound effects are licensed through Storyblocks Audio. All opinions shared are those of the individuals and do not reflect the positions or policies of any company or organization with which they happen to be associated.